Doctors with disabilities exist in small but impactful numbers. How do they navigate their journey? What are the challenges? What are the benefits to patients and to their peers? And what can we learn from their experiences? Join us as we explore the stories of doctors, PAs, nurses, OTs, PTs, pharmacists, dentists, and other health professionals with disabilities. We'll also be interviewing the researchers and policymakers that drive medicine forward towards real equity and inclusion. I am Peter Poulos, and I am thrilled to bring you the Docs with Disabilities podcast. Hello and welcome back to the Docs with Disabilities podcast. Today we are joined by public health researcher and disability advocate, Ms. Rashira Dobson. In this episode, Ms. Dobson and Dr. Poulos discuss the interactions between disability and chronic illness, how the experience with disability in the healthcare system changes throughout different life stages, and the intersection of race, gender, and disability. We begin with an introduction by Ms. Dobson. I am a researcher at Morehouse School of Medicine. I do public health research, looking into mitigating health inequities found specifically in underserved communities, such as black and brown and disabled communities. Um, Outside of my typical nine to five job, I am a disability justice activist and strategist. I do a lot of content creation and grassroots advocacy on the national um, and state level as well. And so I'm really excited to be here to talk about my experience being in the healthcare field as a Black disabled woman and how we can bring more representation um, and visibility specifically for BIPOC communities in the area and intersectionality of disability and racial equity. So my disabilities are actually really rare. I actually identify in having chronic illness and rare diseases, and I use those terms distinctly because even though they do have overlapping traits, they are distinctly different. And so my chronic illness results in having visible disabilities as well. And so I was born with Golden Heart Syndrome. It's considered a cranial or facial disability that affects my face. And so that's where the visible disability portion comes from. And as a result of that, I am deaf and hard of hearing. I was born without a right ear. And then I was also born with Vader syndrome, which more so consists of internal congenital birth defects as well. Over the course of my life, I've had to have a lot of reconstructive surgery. In this next section, Ms. Dobson discusses the unique challenges she faced as a Black woman with both chronic health conditions and disabilities, and how these experiences led to a career in health policy and disability advocacy. my compiled lived experiences of having a disability as a result of being born with congenital birth defects and a rare disease have really made my disability experience quite unique (laughs) and unorthodox. I will be transparent and say I would have never thought myself to be in this place, especially on this side of the healthcare spectrum. Growing up as a Black disabled girl, I was really the only one in my community with the type of disability that I had and the chronic illness that I had. I was born in 91, and so there really wasn't a lot of research and science out there relating to my disability and chronic illness. And so for a very, very long time, probably for the first 10 years of my life, my physicians and providers more so dealt with the symptoms of my disability and not necessarily the deficit of my disability, if that makes sense. And so that's where a lot of the reconstructive surgery has come from. If you can imagine going through so much reconstructive surgery and chronic illness, I experienced a lot of hardship in my education journey. I was not the one who was said to go to college or do good on the SAT or do any of those things that typical high school students do because I was so sick I wasn't in school enough to learn the material. But somehow I was able to graduate high school with my high school diploma and then go to college. And then it really wasn't until I graduated college 
that I had a rude awakening on how difficult it would be to be a young adult with a disability trying to matriculate mm-hmm. into the workplace. And so from that, I kind of got thrusted into grassroots advocacy. I had to advocate a lot for myself in the workplace, especially in workplace discrimination, bias, bullying. I had to face all of that. And so I had to become an advocate. I really didn't choose it. It kind of chose me because I didn't really have a choice. And so with my lived experience and my passion for advocacy, um, I discovered public health and I was like, oh, this seems to be the perfect field for me to go into where I can utilize my experience and skills and advocacy and also try to help form policy for other people with disabilities. And so last year I graduated with my master's in public health and I'm going to be starting a PhD program this fall as well. And so this has really been an interesting journey. For children and young adults, receiving the proper accommodations in school is essential to achieving equity in education. Listen in as Ms. Dobson recounts her less than ideal experience with her school system, the assumptions that she was less able in elementary school despite being intellectually talented, the scrutiny people with distinctive facial features face by the public, and how where you live in the United States dictates the care you receive. When you're considered medically fragile, they really don't know where to place you. So they put me in special education as a result of being placed in special education. I was in speech therapy for at least 12 of those years in school. (laughs) When you have a disfigurement or a defect that is on your face, it really throws people off. People with craniofacial conditions, they do deal with uh, an additional level of scrutiny and stigma when it comes to our competency and ability. So I, that's also one of the things I have had to also combat in my, in my lived experience is getting people to recognize me and see me outside of my facial deformity or my ear deformity. In one uh, of your posts, you wrote, I couldn't qualify for a Medicaid waiver because Georgia does not recognize my disability or rare disease. And despite being born with a condition that affects me every day of my life, I can't qualify for health coverage. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your fight with the state of Georgia and why they don't recognize your disability. Oh, man. (laughs) We'll be talking a long time. I mean, everyone knows Georgia politically what we are as a state, primarily a red state. And so things such as Medicaid expansion are non-existent here which has resulted in hundreds and thousands of Georgians without health insurance. When you look into the margins of who those hundreds and thousands of people are, most of those people are low income and most of those people are from BIPOC communities. I was not born and raised in the state of Georgia. I'm actually from California. I moved to Georgia when I came here to college and I decided to stay afterwards, not truly realizing the type of healthcare infrastructure I was embedding myself into. Mm-hmm. Of course, the healthcare system in California is grossly different. And so that was never really a struggle for my family and I, because even being raised by a single parent, I always qualified for Medicaid. You know, I was always able to get some type of supplement and support and disability benefits. However, when I became an adult and lived to Georgia, you know, me being young and not knowing, oh, I actually need this type of coverage and knowing that my state did not support or have that type of coverage, it really came down to a life and death situation. Mm -hmm. So much so that I actually, at one point, I had to leave the state and go back to my home state of California just to see a doctor and a specialist because I could not access any type of care. And so my healthcare experience in the state of Georgia has really been an uphill battle. Mm -hmm. And to be completely honest, it wasn't until I became a master's student that I had gotten health insurance. Graduate students are required to have health insurance. And that was the first time I started consistently seeing a primary care physician. <laughs> and that's crazy, right? Because someone with yeah. a disability, you would think that it would automatically be given. But because of the health uh, policy laws in the state of Georgia, they're so stringent and they're not accessible unless you have employee-based insurance or unless you fall under the poverty line, or unless you qualify for disability benefits, 
you're not able to get access to any type of health care. I don't qualify for disability benefits because um, obviously I'm not disabled enough, which I'm just like, how does that work? But the way that even some of our Medicaid laws are set up, some of those screening things are really unequitable for people mm-hmm. who don't necessarily fall in the margins of what they consider to be a disability. And so it really traps people in a cycle of poverty and unable to access health care because my disability I'm still able to work. I'm still able to use all of my limbs, but I can go through periods of of having limitations in which I do need support and accommodations. And unfortunately, our Medicaid system, it just doesn't support the full range of people with disabilities and what they need. In this next section, Dr. Poulos and Ms. Dobson discuss the differences in how disabled children and disabled adults are treated and viewed in our society and the problem with inspirationalizing disabled children. So you wrote, as a child, resources were so accessible, doctors only saw a disabled child who needed care, not what I looked like. In adulthood, my disability was no longer the focus. The focus became my functionality. I was faced with awkward stares and ludicrous assumptions. Combining that challenge with the sudden lack of compassion and care was hard to adjust to. So it sounds like you're making a distinction here between being a child patient and being an adult patient. Yeah. And then can you elaborate on that? Yeah, it's forever the soapbox I stand on because everyone likes a disabled child, right? That's where we get a lot of the back and behind terms and euphemisms such as special needs and differently able children because for some reason it's cute to be a child with a disability because the whole thing is we can uh, we can cure the child and that child is inspirational. And trust me, I was the poster child for inspiration. I mean, mm-hmm. thinking back on it, I would get awards in school for simply just being who I was. And I was like, I didn't do anything extra special or phenomenal. At least I didn't think I did. But because the whole school knew that I was disabled and I had overcome another surgery, you get an award. The side that a lot of people with disabilities don't talk about is you are being sensationalized and inspirationalized on one end. But they don't realize that as soon as that comes and you hit 18 years old, that inspiration and that sensationalism, it ends. And then you become a burden on society. I thought I was cute. I thought I was inspirational. I thought I was strong. And now you're turning on me and you're saying that I'm incompetent, that I'm not an equally contributing member to society. Like, how are you supposed to fight against those odds? And so I always try, especially to encourage parents Stop doing that to your children. Stop building them up and making them some sort of inspiration. And you really have to be real with them and teach them how to live with a disability, not just as a child, but as an adult. Because childhood is temporary. Adulthood lasts a lot longer. And it's a heck of a lot tougher to navigate as an adult person with a disability in this work. Because then you're going to deal with people's perceptions. And you're going to deal with accommodation. You're going to start talking about the ability to have children, to get married. All of these things that sometimes and unfortunately a lot of parents aren't just thinking about. And I was like, we have to start thinking long term, not just when your child is in elementary school and and the world is all rose and glasses. And I know that sounds a little harsh, but it is a reality. I can't tell you how many disabled adults that feel so lost, feel so confused, feel so silent because they grew up with that same type of mentality and then their bubble gets burst and then they have no idea who they are or how to even function and navigate in a world that consistently rejects them. That's really powerful. You went from being an inspiration to being a burden. The local politics surrounding healthcare often shape the experiences of disabled individuals. 
In this section, Ms. Dobson discusses how policy work can have downstream effects on vulnerable communities. I wrote a blog post called Upstream Politics and the Downward Negative Health Outcomes That Impact Us. And so you mentioned in that post that healthcare is neither a right nor a privilege, but a necessity for marginalized communities. I was wondering if you can discuss some specific strategies to make healthcare more accessible and equitable for these communities. As an early career professional and really still getting my feet wet in the policy space, one of the strategies that I have found that is really helpful is that we really need our policymakers and our stakeholders to start inviting more people with disabilities into the conversation. Mm. That has to be the number one strategy if we're ever going to develop and build out what equity looks like in a sustainable way. We have to get people who are actually facing the inequity to start talking and kind of filling in the gaps because it's really hard to talk about how to build uh, solutions to inequity and you've lived a life of privilege. <laughs> you have no right. idea what inequity feels like. As a Black woman with a disability, you will never know what it's like, what the barriers I specifically experience if you've been a white man your whole life and you've never had to face those specific challenges. I know people think DEI and all these stuff, they have really weaponized and politicized those terms. And it breaks my heart because it's just like, it's not what you think it is. We're literally trying to build out a table so we can have more sustainability for the people who are most marginalized. Um, yeah. And so for me, that has that is the first solution. We can't even talk about any of the other stuff or the practical things until we first get more disabled people in the room. Disabled people are the main people that can tell you best. This is what I've experienced. This is what it feels like when I experience this. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I read an article, I think it was beginning of this year, about perceived bias from practitioners on disabled people. And, and the reason why this bias occurs among practitioners and providers against disabled people, because you still have a lot of providers and doctors in the space who truly don't understand what it's like to live with a disability because they're not disabled themselves. But when you get a doctor in the room who is not only a doctor, but who has a disability, they have a different lens and perspective that it's not mm -hmm. a privilege. And they're able to say, you know what? I need to maybe look at this patient in another way, not necessarily in the medical model in which disability says this is a deficit, this is broken, this is something that needs to be fixed, but holistically, how can I treat that patient and make sure I am adhering to their needs? One of the quotes that I absolutely love and really have championed, this is a, a president of our institution, Dr. Valerie Montgomery Rice, she says, equity is basically giving people what they need in the way that they need it. And we need mm -hmm. more doctors, we need more professionals, we need more practitioners to start thinking, not giving people equity or what they need in the way that they think that they need it, but in the way the person actually needs it. But we need more people with that type of mindset and thinking to be able to start building and creating these strategies and mm -hmm. infrastructure so we can have more rich conversations and solutions as a result. Representation matters. Nothing about us. Without us. <laughs> you identified the political determinants of health. This was a term that I hadn't heard before. The PDOH as a key factor in health outcomes, particularly in marginalized communities. And so how could policymakers be encouraged to consider political determinants of health when formulating policy? Yes, that was even a new framework that I've recently dug into. And I've actually gotten that framework from attorney Daniel Dawes, who was previously at Morehouse School of Medicine. And his whole framework and concept is in the policy space, we know as upstream politics and downstream politics. And so to make it really simple, what happens at the top? So if you have policymakers, stakeholders at the top, and they are, you know, proposing and drafting up all this legislation and policy, 
but they're not necessarily thinking about how that's going to be downstream. And when we're talking about downstream, we're talking about communities, we're talking about populations, we're talking about people are at the bottom. And then the policy leaders and the legislators, they are at the top. And a really great way of thinking about this is, let's take, for example, uh, a public health issue such as gun violence, okay? Because that's a really hot topic right now, gun violence. When we continue to have legislation that does not regulate access to guns, then that makes it free for all in our communities. And then our communities begin to lack policy and barriers around who is able to get access to guns. Because of the decision that was made at the top of policy leaders and legislators and saying, we don't want to do anything about gun control laws. We're just going to allow it to be as it is. Then the downstream effect is that Joe Blow has access to guns in which he's now able to go into the community and incite violence. And now we have a very real public health issue of mental health, PTSD, death, <laughs> grief, all of these compiling health factors that are now affecting the community. And so I think it is a very layered and complex, but to make it really, really simple, we have to start getting policymakers to understand the decisions that they make are impacting the community in more magnified ways, <clears throat> excuse me, in more magnified ways than what they're even accounting for. What you do at the top is always going to have a trickle down effect. It's not just about those who are in Congress because they may not have the effect because they made the decision and they are in the bubble within their decision. However, the result of their decision or their negligence or the lack of decision, the communities at the bottom are suffering the consequences or the benefits of those decisions that they make. Yeah, this seems like a really basic point. Like, hey, let's think about the effects of our policies and laws when we're making them. And, and unfortunately, a lot of our policymakers I think sometimes they become disconnected from the greater community, right? We need right. more people in policy spaces who are better connected and representative of their communities being at the top to make those decisions who have thoughtfully and critically thought and through, uh, thought through what are the consequences? What are the outcomes? What are the variabilities yeah. all involved in this and then able to make an informed decision instead of having policymakers making decisions, and they may not fully be aware or informed. I mean, this is just common sense, really. <laughs> the fact that we have to even uh, advocate for this is just infuriating. Disability does not occur in a vacuum. It is important to recognize how race, gender, sexual orientation, and socioeconomic status play into the disabled experience. Let's hear from Ms. Dobson about her work on intersectionality and disability. So you wrote another piece on intersection of race, gender, and disability. And you said in that piece that you believe Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw may have omitted some important identity groups when establishing her narrative for intersectional work. So can you elaborate on which identity groups you think to be given more attention in intersectionality studies. Yes, and let me first say, I'm a big fan of Dr. Crenshaw's work. I think she set a really strong precedence for what we now are seeing it unfold. You know, they always say, when you introduce new concepts into a body of science, it takes at least 20 years for that generation to catch up. And so a lot of what Dr. Crenshaw's work was really establishing a good foundation 20 plus years later, we're really starting to see how intersectionality is really impacting the work that we do. However, I can say as a Black disabled woman, I was able to be like, yes, yes, this is great. I identify myself here, but we're not talking about disability. And that was the part that was missing for me because I was like, unlike you, Dr. Crenshaw, when I go into a workplace, I'm not only dealing with the race factor, I'm not only dealing with the gender factor, I now have another marginalized identity that now having to combat 
And there is really no literature or guidebook in how to combat that. And, you know, I had someone ask me the other day, like, how do I um, deal with microaggressions? And I had to give him an honest answer. I really do not experience a lot of microaggressions when it comes to being a woman. And the microaggressions I experience, even as a Black person, they are minimal compared to the microaggressions I experience as a disabled person. Mm -hmm. And that's a big thing that a lot of people don't understand. And building upon Dr. Crenshaw's framework, we have to start looking at those who are multiply marginalized. That is a very new terminology, but especially mm -hmm. for those who may be dealing with marginalized identities that are more heavily scrutinized and that mm -hmm. there isn't a lot of research or support behind. And unfortunately, disability, even though the ADA was passed 30 years ago, it is just now, probably within the past five years, starting to become talked about as a lived experience and identity. Unlike the Black, African-American identity, even gender identities, those issues have always been talked about, at least since the passage of the civil rights legislation. But a lot of the movement behind disability, it really hasn't gotten a lot of public and mainstream recognition that you see today. And so I think we need to do a better job and looking, like I said, further into the margins of how is having multiply marginalized identities are uh, impacting a person's uh, experience and how they're able to navigate in places such as the healthcare system and in places such as the workplace. Because like I said, when I go to the doctor's office, I'm not thinking about discrimination of my doctor discriminating against me because I'm a woman. I'm thinking, does my doctor even know the type of condition that I have? And I've experienced also being referred out to other doctors, not even be able to get access to health care just for the fact that I have a disability, a chronic disability at that, a rare disability at that, which makes even my insurance and my level of access to specialists who are actually informed to treat the type of disability and rare disease that I was born with are all out of my network. <laughs> They're all out of my network. And so then that adds an additional layer of access for me to know that I'm not actually a part of the general population when it comes to just general health problems. It's always going to be more specialized. It's always going to be more marginalized, which means the barrier is just going to be that much greater. How would you suggest researchers quantify the impact of intersectionality on health outcomes? Is it possible to discern the effects of intersecting identities from each other in health studies? I think it is possible. And I think me being a qualitative researcher, I think that's where a lot of that data is going to come from. Mm -hmm. But in order to get that data, we have to engage. And so I think for me, as a researcher, I find myself in a space now in really increasing engagement with BIPOC communities, disabled communities, to start hearing stories, to start getting narratives of BIPOC people with disabilities and what their lived experience is. Because when we look in the canon of research, it's really not a lot out there. There's not even a lot of information out there about women with disabilities, more so than just all people, men and right. women, all genders with disabilities. And so I think qualitative research is really going to be instrumental in really what that lived experience looked like and then relating that out back to the outcomes. And then once we're able to get people with disabilities in the space to hear their stories, that's when we can start asking more of that quantitative data, start asking the demographics. Where do you live? What's your income level? What's your education level? Do you have health insurance? You know, basic questions and building that upon to be able to tell a larger story. I know that there are a lot of disabled researchers or people who are committed to disability research who are really starting to try and connect those dots and be able to create a database in which we actually have ample evidence. Like I think I saw a report come out within the past year or so that it was the first time I ever seen it. Like how many black people have disabilities? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like something as simple as that. But mm -hmm. me having a qualitative research brain, I'm like, okay, we now know that there are about 5 million African Americans in the United States who have disabilities. What kind of disabilities do they have? Where do they live? 
Do their parents have disabilities? Are they educated? Asking those more deeper and intentional questions, Mm -hmm. it also begins to reveal some of the inequities that are layered upon the racial inequities, such as Mm -hmm. we all know that the South has one of the largest populations of African Americans. That's not by coincidence. The South also has some of the largest populations of people who are of lower socioeconomic status, okay? Now we have a bunch of people, for example, who live in Jackson, Mississippi, mostly poor, black, disabled people who are without clean water. You know, we've all heard about the Jackson, Mississippi yeah. water crisis. How is that going to affect their health outcomes? Yeah. Yeah. Five, especially disabled, who most of them are on disability benefits. I'm like, why is no one talking about this? Because then if you have a whole generation of children who are being born into that type of broken infrastructure, what is that going to look like five, 10 years, 20 years down the road? I think I saw that now in that area, they had like an outbreak of some uh, sexually transmitted disease. And I'm just like, we know this is not all by coincidence, right? Like these are confounding factors that are happening upon each other. And we need to know the data and we need to start tracking why and getting the stories of these people. How do you envision the future of intersectional studies, particularly in public health? I think intersectionality has to be applied to all population health groups, because I think we have been looking at population health in a very narrow and singular lens. Mm. And the more that our world grows, the more as our population develops and increases, the more we see people are starting to cross over into other lived experiences, other identities, other things that are really equally, that are equally as impacting to their health outcomes, just as their race and their age. And so I would admonish the public health community to really prioritize a conversation and research around intersectionality. It takes more work. It does, because you really have to be committed to kind of just not doing the safe thing. You really have to get into the margins, connecting with these populations and really and seeing where their true inequity lies. When we really tap into that, I think we're going to unlock really beautiful solutions that can really take the public health field from where it is and to where it needs to be in the future, which needs to be more equitable for all populations, right? Mm -hmm. And so as far as current methodologies and trends, I think they're doing a better job in really bringing in inclusion into the conversation and bringing in diversity into a conversation. This may not be a specific methodology, but I think it is a strategy that can get people to think about how to conduct research in a more unorthodox way that can get us the answers that we've been looking for. I think we have learned that sometimes a traditional way is not necessarily the best way to mitigate some of these health problems and health outcomes that we are starting to see pop up in our community. It took a public health crisis to really amplify and magnify that there are some really, really in, embedded health inequities that were in a lot of communities that we were simply overlooking and not addressing just because all of us were just going with the status quo. And so mm-hmm. now that's forced us as a healthcare community to really start looking at the margins, not just so we can, you know, prevent the next public health crisis, but so we can start delivering better healthcare, especially for underserved communities. And so I would say that the way public health is right now those who are in research, those who are providers, continue to do the work that you're doing and connecting, you know, your practical things in with the community. I think continue to talk, to engage, to have the hard conversations, to have the dialogue, to continue to invite collaborators into the space where healthcare doesn't just have to look like one person or embody one system, but it is a multi-system. It is multi-complex and it is intersectional. And I think when we start applying that type of methodology, I think we will have a better healthcare system. To a young disabled person who wants to work in medicine or healthcare, what would you say to them? I would say it's absolutely possible and don't put yourself in the box. And sometimes our hardships and our challenges, we think they're there to destroy us. 
but really they are there to make us stronger. And not stronger as in you'll never feel weakness or you'll never feel tired or discriminated against or bullied because you very well may experience all of those things and even more. However, you have to keep your purpose and your why in which you want to go into medicine and healthcare. And that is going to be anchor that is going to get you through the really hard times and the tough times. Change does not happen overnight. It is a long process. Always keep the long uh, outcome in mind. And you'll get there. Yep. That's, uh, I look at a lot of, at a lot of my defeats or setbacks as temporary. I think, like you said in one of your articles, the arc of the universe bends toward justice. Isn't that what Dr. King said? Yes. One of my favorite quotes. (laughs) <laughs> well, it's such a pleasure talking to you, Rashira. I just really appreciate all the work that you're doing. Keep doing the good work. Yes, absolutely. Thank you to our guest, Ms. Rashira Dobson, for sharing your wisdom and expertise with us today. We are so grateful for your insight on how age, politics, and intersectional identity affect the disabled experience. To our audience, thank you so much for joining us for this episode. We hope you subscribe to our podcast and tune in next time. This podcast is a production of the Docs with Disabilities Initiative and is supported by a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation with additional support from the Stanford Medicine Alliance for Disability Inclusion and Equity, the University of Michigan Medical School Department of Family Medicine M. Disability Initiative, and the Ford Foundation. The opinions on this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of the hosts, their respective institutions, or the funders. This podcast is released under Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Non-Derivative License. The episode was produced by Lisa Meeks, Gabe Abrams, and Jacob Feeman.